Hello, my name is Jack Wellman. I'm the pastor of the Mulvane Brethren Church in Mulvane, Kansas. Very small town and I just have such a passion for the loss that I have just about finished and by me by the time you hear this I finished a book on called Effective Evangelization How to Reach the Lost. Subtitle Moving from the Great Omission to the Great Commission. Let me explain what I'm talking about here. My outreach and witnessing experiences come with a lot of frustrations. I've made a lot of mistakes. In fact, for years it was a sin of disobedience from not doing any evangelization at all. I was not a good witness. I was not a witness at all, and that's even the worst. Uh, I was a light and salt, but the salt never really got out of the shaker. As they say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can feed him salty peanuts. This is what I purport to do for you. To show you how not to witness is just as important as how to witness. You can tell I'm not a professional writer. I'm not a professional speaker. But I am professional in my faith in Christ. I am pro-Christ. I don't care if this presentation has mistakes, it has grammatical errors, it has uh, things that may not sound real smooth and slick, but the power is in the message and it's not in the messenger. The Bible and Christian history is replete with stories where God uses improbable people to do impossible things and if you consider yourself as a vessel of God, He can take even the worst witness and mix it with the power of the Word of God and save people from hell. For a lot of years I used my own sin of omission is sitting in what I would call a pew potato sitting in the church being a silent Christian an underground believer and that is sheer disobedience to Christ's great commission where he gives it five times five commands that are really imperative commands and these imperative commands were given by Christ it's the same kind of command that where you might tell your children or small child, get out of the street, run, get over here. What I'm saying is it's a command that is a life-saving command. You're saving lives of those people that don't know Christ yet. Their eternal destination, I don't have to remind you, is not something that you want people to, to send them to. I went to a church one time to help them build an outreach program and as a coordinator of an outreach program we went door to door. We started off with like 25 people I think it was and we went through training and I trained also with an evangelist and I went door to door with him kind of watched, followed, listened, looked and see what he did and we tried to follow, I tried to follow the same methods that he used. And it's not a really easy thing to do, but the more times you witness, the easier it does become. It's kind of a scary thing in a way because when you're knocking on someone's door, you have no idea what they're going to say, if they're going to be receptive, uh, if they're even going to open the door. One time we went to a door to share the gospel and they had a sign on the door that had a Beelzebub symbol. It was kind of like devil worship. And so there, one of our first experiences was trying to share the gospel of Christ with some Satanistic worshipers. Interestingly enough, they did listen and they heard the gospel and they asked a few questions. Now whether they came to saving faith or not, I don't know. 
but the thing is to remember is it's not your responsibility your responsibility is to share the gospel it is their response to his ability his meaning Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit does the work there's power in the word and the message the power is not in the messenger but unless they get a messenger to give them the message they're never going to hear the gospel I went to this church that had shrunken membership and they were considering closing the doors and my first thought was we need to go out and try to reach some people knock on some doors get out and meet the community so I started going into businesses and to the uh, nursing home or the assisted living care center uh, going door to door and many of the people I knocked on the doors there said it has been 25 to 30 years since anyone has ever knocked on their door and shared the gospel with them I thought that was tragic now let me say too before we get into the training you may have more effective methods of reaching people and this is not a concrete way of doing it all ends all and but so I'm just saying that listen to this and see if you cannot learn ways and methods that are effective in evangelization and not putting pressure on yourself because ultimately John 6 44 no one comes to Christ except the Father draws him you the responsibility is with the sower and we bring the seed and we might fertilize or we might water but God gives the increase it's not our responsibility to encourage them to come to Christ or to help them along come to Christ but the Holy Spirit does that and convicts the heart I went out and kind of learned by the seat of my pants and made a lot of mistakes but that's okay because you learn more from mistakes but the thing is I was out there and even the worst witness as I said before is is better than no witnessing at all get this picture in your mind here's a guy and it's a true story a guy's walking his dog and it's like about 4 30 or 5 in the morning and he sees a fire on the second floor on the first floor I beg your pardon and he went over there and thought there's a fire and of course he did not have a cell phone with him so he wasn't able to call 911 all the neighbors all the lights were out there was no one up so he started pounding on the door and he realized that it's a two-story house that there's probably bedrooms upstairs and people were upstairs asleep and there's a fire and so he started pounding on the door and he got nothing he was about to panic and he started yelling and he started yelling fire and no one came awake he he rang the doorbell pounded on the door nothing the neighbor uh, neighbor's dog started barking but that wasn't going to help so what he did is he did something pretty bold he took a chair that was on the front porch and he threw it through their uh, living room window and then he went into the house and started yelling fire by then the fire was in pretty uh, had started it had a pretty good start and was into what the kitchen area probably where it started and then started going into the dining room but this is near where the stairwell was so he ran upstairs and yelled and this was about 23 years ago now but I can still remember hearing the story that man had not been bold enough to go in there to that house and knock on that door and then finally got no response he went in and alerted the people that lived there that they would have perished in the fire apparently they didn't have smoke detectors back then twenty some years ago they were not as common as they are now or twenty two years ago now the man saved their life and they all got out the point is there is another fire that's coming and, and this fire is a hellfire and are we going to be embarrassed or shy about knocking on someone's door to warn them of the coming wrath of God because God is a holy God he's a just God 
His wrath is upon the sinner. He's angry at the sinner every day. And imagine this. Someone has at one time or another shared the faith of Christ with you. You would not be here unless somebody along the way shared the message of the gospel with you. And I'm telling you, that's what our imperative command is from Jesus Christ. I implore you to think about that. Think about their eternity. Think about their eternal destination. Be separated from God forever in a hellfire with never ever having a second chance to be reconciled to God. It's only by the grace of God that we are here and that we were saved by Jesus Christ. But we needed a witness. I'm going to tell you here how to talk to people that are family members and sometimes those are the most difficult co-workers you're also going to learn hopefully learn how to share the gospel with your neighbors and with the city that you live in and eventually even people that are in the stores at the post office and anywhere you go I went to the mall one time and I was terrified but when I came out of there, I had shared the gospel with people. One uh, couple of groups, or one group from Israel, and where I used the Old Testament, the prophecies of Jesus. And another group, uh, a Muslim, one guy in Spanish. And since I'm Spanish, I do speak Spanish and I'm bilingual. Sorry, my computer froze up there and one even with a young teenager. Now I did not let the looks of this young man throw me off because God looks at the heart. I do not judge a person by their exterior. I went up and witnessed to a guy that looked like he rode in from the group of Hell's Angels in leather jacket, tattoos, a uh, real man's man. He was a machinist and he drove a bike, a motor, a chopper actually. And I finally got up the courage to go witness to him at work and I found out he was a Christian. He was an on fire Christian. So you can't judge a person by that side. I went up to this young boy about 15, shared the faith with uh, Jesus Christ with him and that young man shared it with his girlfriend and he was so excited that he had never heard the method that I'll teach you about. It's called the way of the master and it's using what the method that Jesus Christ used in sharing the gospel. And that's what I want to show you. How Jesus brought the message of salvation is the way that you can use the way of the master and we know if Jesus used the method of it is effective. Now one of the ways that Jesus did not use, you hear a lot of people say, Jesus loves you, and of course he does. But he never said this. He came up to anybody and said, Jesus loves you. Please let me into your heart. You have a God-shaped vacuum. Let me fill it. I'll bring you joy, peace, and love, and happiness. Now of course he will bring those things but you never saw Jesus ever use that method that we tend to use. Incidentally, you know there's only one in twenty Christians will share their faith with another person. Only one out of twenty born-again believers in evangelical churches share their faith on a regular basis. Even though it's an imperative command to share the gospel I do not understand why we are so hesitant to share such good news. It's like if you had a, a cure for cancer and you're holding the cure here and you know it will bring life and you're not willing to share it, why would you not want to bring that good news to someone who's going to die and an eternal death and it's incurable? 100% of humans have the fatal disease called humanity. They die. We have a cure. I hope that we can help 
get the salt out of the shaker. Problem is many believers just don't know what to say. When you go up to someone, you're really not sure what to say. They're worried about offending somebody. They're about being embarrassed or being rejected. But again, as we, I said before, there's power in the message, not in the messenger. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God's word goes out of his mouth and does not return void without effect. Isaiah 55, 11 shows that his word, the word of God, the Bible, goes out and it accomplishes what it went out for. It saves lives. After Christ's return, we're safely in the kingdom. You're not going to be thinking about, I wished I had not been so laughed at or scorned. Of. This is a sobering scripture. I'm going to read it. Luke 9:26. And this one is kind of a, one of those that made me really open my eyes that I was being ashamed of the the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 9.26 says, If anyone is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. That was a wake-up call for me. When I don't share the gospel, it's because I'm ashamed to tell others about it, basically. I'm afraid to tell others because I'm being embarrassed. But it's the same as denying Jesus Christ before others. And this is very serious. In Luke 12, verse 9, same chapter, same book, Luke. But he who denies me before men and mankind, is what that means, will be denied before the angels of God. Ouch. Let it never be so, my Lord and my God. Oh. But that is exactly what I was doing. Eventually, I realized that someone had to share the gospel with me, and if not, I was on a path to hell. Charles Spurgeon, one of the old evangelists of, I believe it's the 18th century, or 20th century, I beg your pardon, he said, if a person doesn't tell others about Christ, then he wonders if that person is saved or not. Now, I was shocked today that many of these churches today are not doing evangelization. They're not going door to door. The church that I used to attend and taught Sunday school in for many years in the town I'm in, they never went out door to door. But they were the only church that would do it occasionally. They would do it a few months in the summer until it got too hot, and then a few months in the fall, until it got too cold in the winter. In the church I'm at now, the Mulvane Brethren Church, I'm trying to go out every Saturday. Sometimes hot. 105, 110. I try to play it. I'm, I'm cautious because sometimes I'm almost 60, so I have to watch the heat. But listen to this. Over 50% of those polled from ages 25 to 69. So most people, over 50%, are open to someone coming to their door to invite them to the church or to share the gospel. So over half the doors that you will, according to the Barnard Group's latest research says, over 50% of them are open. They're going to listen to you. They may not respond right away. But again, that's not your responsibility. It is their response to his ability, God's ability. That means that 4% of churches nationwide are utilizing an active outreach program, meaning that 96% of the people in our nation, in our neighborhoods, where the churches are at, are being unreached. So only about 5% of churches, evangelical churches in this nation, are going door to door on a regular basis. Even though Christ said five times, it's an imperative command, go, make disciples of other nations, teaching them all things that I have taught you. The vast majority of people, again, are open to visitation, more so than a TV ad, a newspaper ad, uh, a flyer. 
Now the training I'm going to give you here is going to be so simple. It's going to be it's kind of an acrostic and it goes by a simple four letters. W D J D. W D J D. W as in what? D as in did. J as in Jesus and D as in do. Now it means what did Jesus do? That's easy to remember because this is what Jesus did. This is the very same method that Jesus Christ used in the working of his ministry. Door-to-door -door evangelism, it's pretty much a disappearing art. It used to be more active before then and uh, from my own years of experience, and tra I trained with an evangelist. I went through uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron have a training called Hell's Best Kept Secret. It's Hell's Best Kept Secret because nobody's using it. And people are taking something that is such a powerful thing. What Jesus did, the Word of God, everything Jesus said was Holy Scripture, and they're not utilizing it. And rather than not knowing what to say or how to say it, they say nothing at all. It's the silence, I would say call it the sin of silence. Now there's a lot of different ways you can share the gospel with uh, adults and children. Children is a little bit slightly different, although it's still based upon belief. In fact, there's one story that said one time that I heard a mother had been sharing the gospel with her son, a young son, about six or seven, trying to share the gospel with a young child. My own uh, daughter, the one, only one I had left in the nest, was saved at age seven. Well, this six, five, six, seven-year-old boy, I can't remember now, I think it was like six, went into the kitchen and had a big, long steak knife pointed to his chest. He was ready to plunge the knife into his heart when his mother caught him and screamed. She said, what are you doing? He said, I was going to let Jesus come into my heart. Wow. So children are concrete thinkers. They do not think in the abstract way. And besides, it's not about letting Jesus into your heart. It's about believing in. John 3.16 says, whoever believes in me will never perish but have eternal life. Believing in means trusting in, relying in, having faith in, leaning upon. It's not about letting someone come into your heart or having peace, joy, and love. Although those are residual effects, it's about belief. No one was ever saved by filling out a decision card. No one is saved by walking down the aisle. And really, no one is really saved by saying a sinner's prayer or repeating a sinner's prayer. They are saved by believing in Jesus Christ, having faith in God that He can deliver us. Now, these methods are pretty simple, as I said before, and you'll have training materials, you'll have uh, ways that you can memorize, you'll hopefully have a little uh, card that you can put down WJD, or you can just write down the initials, or you can memorize them. Uh, there's ways that I'm going to try to train you on door-to-door, -door, how to go door-to-door, -door and what you're going to say. Uh, how to do cold call witnessing like in the mall in the street and it sounds scary but it's something that you will learn to become comfortable with the more you do it and then you're going to find that you'll have an unspeakable joy and peace when you start sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ there's going to be nothing like that that you've ever experienced when I went to the mall and shared the gospel with, with those folks I left and I was like a foot, I was probably a foot off the ground. One thing I want to tell you that when I go out door to door in the community, I'm not there to build church membership up. I'm not trying to fill the pews up. 
I'm not trying to put notches in my spiritual belt. I am trying to snatch people out of the jaws of hell. I'm trying to share the gospel, bring the message of the good news of eternal life in Christ. I never focus and say, now that you believe in Jesus Christ or if you'd like to come to our church and you can find Jesus there. No. If they have found Christ there and they want to believe on Jesus Christ there, I can show them the plan of salvation. And if you do not know how to explain the gospel and what it means to you, then you're going to have a hard time explaining that to someone else. So we'll learn how to what the gospel is. And I know that sounds simple, but unless you know, for example, you can tell a person that Jesus was God in first in John chapter one, the Gospel of John, that he was God and he came as a human, was born as a baby, lived as a perfect life, without sin, was crucified when he was innocent, was the payment of our sins and atoned for the wrath of God, it was all placed on him. And he was and he died and was resurrected and he's ascended at the right hand of the Father. All of those are the gospel, basically. If a person believes in that, and they trust and rely on that, then they, are a, they can be born again. So, some doors, actually, I went to when I knocked on the, on the doors, I, I found out that it had been 20, 25, 30, 40 years since someone other than a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness has ever knocked on my on their door. But here you have news that was the supreme cost to Jesus Christ. Yet for you and me and others it is absolutely free. Here's a sobering fact. Almost 700,000 people die every day. 700,000 people will die today. That's almost 30,000 people dying every hour. In the next minute, 500 people are going to die. That number is increasing every day because the population is increasing. Now understand this fact, only 33% of them are Christian, and I would guess that it's actually less than that, because people that profess Christ or say, yes, I'm a Christian, and they typically do not all have a abiding faith in Jesus Christ, and nor do they attend church, they show no good works, some are saying they're carnal Christians, and they're, but a deep abiding personal relationship in Jesus Christ is what I'm talking about. So, today, at least 462,000 people will die without Christ. Almost a half a million people will die every day without Christ. And then consider that 95% of Christians do not share their faith. How many more could we be reaching? Let me give you an overview of what I use and it's called Hell's Best Kept Secret and it's basically the way the Master, the way the Master Jesus Christ. You can come up to say a person, would you consider yourself a good person? The troubling thing is that most people that are Christians and then most people that are not Christian, and particularly those that are not professing Christians, say, yeah, I'm a good person. And most people are deceived. Satan has deceived the whole world. They don't know that they're deceived because otherwise they wouldn't be deceived. The prince of the power of the air has blinded those so that they may not see the gospel. Now here's a way you can 
talk to them. Now, that's the sad thing because most people think they're, they've done a lot of good works. They've given close to charity. They give money to the Red Cross, Salvation Army. They think their good works are going to get them into heaven and that a good God would not send them to hell. But good works, we know good works do not save. Works, no one is saved by works. Our works, at best, are filthy rags. So good works are never going to get people into heaven. So most people, if you say, do you consider yourself a good person? They'll say, yeah, I think I'm a pretty good person. In fact, almost everybody who tells me that would agree with that. Now, do you think you've ever broken any of the commandments? They may say yes or no, but if they say, well, I'm not sure, well, remind them. Okay, have you ever stolen anything? Most people will say, yeah. What would you call a person that steals something? A thief. Okay. Have you ever lied to anyone? Oh yeah, most people will admit, yeah, I have lied. Have you ever hated someone? I think most people do say that. Jesus said if you hate someone, you have committed murder in your heart. Based upon that, you've already told me by your own confession that you're a lying, thieving murderer at heart. Now based upon that, if you meet a holy God, would you be innocent or guilty? Most people will think, yeah, I, I think I would probably be guilty. But then they would back off and say, but since I'm a good person, I don't think God would send me to hell. I said, okay, let's consider that you have stolen something, something of value, and you went before a judge. And you tell the judge, Judge, I'm a pretty good person. I do, I do a lot of good things. My cat, sorry. I do a lot of good things. I give to charity. Uh, I donate blood. Uh, things like that. Based upon that, I think I can go free. The judge, no. That's not going to work with the judge. In fact, the judge would say, No, you're guilty. Just because you do nice things doesn't mean you can break the law. Well, then they say, well, God's good. God is love, so he won't send me to hell. Okay, try that with the judge. Judge, you're a good person. You're going to let me go. No. The judge would say, just because I am a good person, I am sending you to jail because you've broken the law. Now, the Ten Commandments are the ones that I'm talking about. The Ten Commandments have never been done away. The rituals of, like the ritual washings and the sacrifices, the, the animal sacrifices, and all of the other rituals, that was nailed to the cross by Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments have never been nailed to the cross because Jesus, when he talked to the young rich ruler who came up to him, he said, Master, Master, what may I do to have eternal life? And then he started naming off the commandments. So, we know that Jesus came to fulfill the law and not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away. So the Ten Commandments are still relevant today. I mean, how can we say that murder is, Jesus nailed that to the cross, and, you know, we can steal and commit adultery, and that's okay because Jesus paid it all. No, the Ten Commandments are still re uh, relevant today. So based upon that, do you think you meet a holy God and you've broken these commandments? And I tell them here, you know what? I've broken most of these commandments too. I was in trouble. I was a lying, thieving, and in some cases an adulterer in my heart. And if you look at a woman or man with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Based upon you breaking a holy law before a holy and just God, do you think you would go to heaven or hell still? And now most people would still say, well, I think so because God is good. No, it does try that in a court of law. It doesn't work. Now if they say, I don't know, I might be in trouble. They may not say I'm going to hell. 
Some might even actually say, yeah, I guess I'm going to hell. Then you can ask, does that concern you? And you, hopefully they will say yes. That's when you can use the gospel. Introduce the gospel. You know, the law of God stops the mouth. It takes away the sin and the excuse. James calls the law a mirror. And it reflects our imperfections. So based upon you're breaking the law and you think and you may have concerns that you're going to hell, let me tell you what, how you can avoid that. Jesus Christ is called an advocate. An advocate is like an attorney who will represent you before the throne of God and the just judge and say, Your Honor, paid in full. I have laid down my life for this person. And I'm telling you, from my word, I have paid the penalty. I would like you to declare him or her innocent on my behalf. Because it's like if you had a speeding ticket and like you're going 30 miles an hour or let's make that 60 miles per hour through a school zone a children's school for the blind okay and it actually slows down to 15 miles per hour and you went through there at 60 miles per hour that's going to be a big fine it's like Jesus came in and paid the fine for you and a ticket that you couldn't afford to pay you cannot pay for your own sins. Good works are never going to be enough in a million lifetimes to pay the penalty. So, that's where you point them to the gospel and to Jesus Christ and tell them that Jesus Christ has paid a fine or paid for your penalty of your breaking the law for a law that you could not have paid for yourself. We can point them to the grace of God, but we use the Ten Commandments because that's the holy standard, and they were written on stones by the finger of God, indicating they were a permanent thing, and they were written by God. The other rituals and oblations and washings and sacrifice uh, rules and like in Leviticus, those were written down by Moses, and those were to be kept in the Old Covenant. But we have a new and better covenant now, and they were written by the finger of God, so they will never expire. They're still in effect today, and whoever breaks the law and, it's, and breaks the least of the law is guilty of them all. We know that that's true. No one can keep the law, but Jesus Christ has kept the law for us. He is our righteousness. We ourselves, even at our best works, are like filthy rags in front of a holy God. In Romans 1 it says, men and women, we're, at, we're without excuse. We denied God and a holy God and broken His law, and we stand before God as guilty. But we can put on His righteousness because He's paid the fine and the atonement he's redeemed us and he's paid a fine that we could not pay okay imagine this the law is like this you are sick but you don't know it okay but you don't even know you're sick and the, and your doctor comes up to you and says hey I've got a cure I've got a cure for you right here and it'll save your life the doctor's going to the the patient's going to say what do you mean? I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Why do I need a cure? Get out of here. That's ridiculous. However, if you tell them about the blood works that you did, here's some x-rays that you have, We have and your MRI images, we have some serious problems. These have this A, B, C, D to show us that you're going to die. The patient then becomes aware of their own finiteness. Uh-oh, I'm going to die. Then you present the cure. So the diagnosis 
is the law. The diagnosis is that they're going to be suffering eternal torment in hell forever, basically. But the cure is the blood of the Lamb. The shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. That is what cures the disease that all humans have. Breaking a holy law. And 100% of humans have that fatal disease. They're humanity. They're going to die. They're not going to live forever. But here's Jesus Christ who was perfect and died and rose again. When he was buried, he couldn't stay dead because he was without sin. The grave could not keep Jesus because he was sinless. Death could not hold him. For us, it can hold us. And we are dead in sin. As you could say, dead men walking. But here's the doctor now that has shown him all the symptoms and given him evidence that he's going to die then the cure sounds wonderful. I mean, it sounds like this is just exactly what I need. But unless they know that they are gravely ill and have a disease that is deadly, they are never going to want the cure. So if you walk up to somebody and say, I would like to introduce you to Jesus. He'll bring you happiness, peace, joy, love. The person is going to think, hey, you know, I'm pretty happy the way I am. I mean, I, I work for the weekends. I get off on weekends. I'm pretty happy. I have a lot of joy. I love my children. You know, I've got a flat screen TV, a 36 inch one. Hey, I'm pretty happy. I have a lot of peace. I live in a quiet neighborhood. So if you offer them happiness, joy, peace, and love, that's not going to mean anything to them. If you show them their disease of sin, that they need a cure that only Jesus Christ can bring, then you're going to realize they're going to realize that they're going to be spending eternity separated from God cast into a lake of fire an eternal torment with no second chance I wrote a small booklet called Do Babies Go to Heaven and I intended to use it as an evangelization book a lot of people I knew that lost children and they, it's hard because you grieve with them. As a pastor, you might want to say, you know, I, you really can't say anything. I'm really so sorry. If those parents are Christian, as David said when he lost his baby, I know that he cannot come to me, but that I can come to him. So King David, after they lost Bathsheba and their David, King David lost their baby, he knew that he would see that baby again someday. So if a Christian parents lose their baby or young children, they know they can see them again in heaven because of the grace of God and they have re not reached the age of accountability. No one knows exactly when the age of accountability is. But we know that they will see them in heaven someday. Now, if they're not Christian, and they're not believers in Christ, then you can say, I'm really sorry. That must be really hard. You know, I know that children that had die in an innocent young age, before the age of accountability, will be with the Father, and in the presence of Jesus. We know that. Because they're too young to know the message of the Gospel, and to understand it, because they're not accountable. That's what that book talked about. Now, it, if you've lost your children, lost a child, the only way that you can see your children again is that if you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We've all broken the law. We're all sinners. No matter what we do, we can never make ourselves right. But Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, has put a bridge between the unreachable chasm of eternity, of hell, and heaven, and bridge the gap. You take away the cross, and there's no way to reach heaven. I can say, from the, my understanding of 
biblical theology that if you accept Jesus Christ and come to him in faith and believe that he was risen and he atoned for your sin the wrath of God was placed on him then you can see your child again in heaven there is no other way but until you accept the blood of the lamb to pay for the penalty that you could not pay and I, I just can't give I, you can't really give them any more hope than that the way to reach people that are without Christ is to show them they have a fatal disease and it's called sin and their sins have separated us from a holy God God cannot look at sin and that's why when Jesus at Calvary the Father looked away and Jesus this is why he said my God my God why have you forsaken me it's because all of the sin of all humanity for all time past and into the future the wrath of God was placed upon Jesus Christ the sin of the world and the worlds to come were placed on him and the Father could not look upon sin and that's why Jesus was so grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane and sweat drops of blood because he knew he would be separated even for a short time from the Father Jesus doesn't want us separated from the Father so he had someone share the gospel of the message even if you never had someone share the gospel of the message and you came to saving faith on your own like in the Bible you did Paul or John or James whoever wrote the books of the Bible and the New Testament or old they were agents they were witnesses to bring you to Jesus Christ to show you the plan of salvation so in my next part I will be t discussing with you effective ways to share the gospel of Christ in ways that you can easily memorize and it's very easy to pass on to people and it's a non-offensive because if you use the law of God you subvert confrontations with them and circumnavigate back to their conscience conscience means with knowledge to use the human conscience to let the law of God convict them the Holy Spirit to show them and Jesus to save them you can be an effective witness for Jesus Christ and I plan to do just that is to share you my mistakes to show you my successes and to even do kind of a cold call example with you of when you knock on the door what are you gonna say what is the first thing you're gonna say what have what are you gonna say when you first meet someone when you come down the street pick the longest line in the grocery market what are you gonna say to that person while you're there in that long checkout line there's a lot of icebreakers too that I can hand out that you can hand out to people and say a good introduction to say here did you get one of these and I'll show you how to get those access to those and there's a lot of free resources that are available out there of how to break the ice and introduce them I also give you protocol about when you do go door to door how you go door to door the protocol about where you go the procedures that you use what you say when they first open the door and how to show respect politeness and mannerisms and not ramming Jesus down their throat but showing them the gospel in an easy method that you can use that almost anyone can use with little training if you will just go I thanks for your time in our next session we'll try to get more into the ways that you can open up a spiritual conversation which is more typically used for families co-workers friends and you're going to show how to introduce the gospel through like world events for example that uh, earthquake we had uh, not long ago or the hurricane 
they might ask you about the weather or what do you think. Well, I says, you know, it sounds a lot like Matthew 24. Have you ever read Matthew 24? That's a little bit what Jesus talked about. The war is now going on, the unrest in the Middle East. You can point him to events. So Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars. The earthquakes in various places, great calamities would increase. There'd be lots of false Christs, which there are now. If you could point them to the Word of God and get their curiosity to the fact that Jesus talked about this, that's interesting. So there's different ways you can use for coworkers, family, friends, and then there's another method you can use when you go door to door. I plan to discuss that with you next time. So I hope you will be with us, and I appreciate your time and trouble. Forgive my poor lighting images here, and it looks like my reflection of my computer monitor there. Sorry about that. And uh, I really appreciate that. God bless. And may Jesus go with you on your witnessing call. But follow the way of the Master. And do what Jesus did. You cannot fail. Using the Word of God. And the way of God. And the power is in the message. Not in the messenger. God bless you. and Thank you very much.